G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel. In today's video, we are gonna be taking a look at each individual club, like most of my videos, and I'm gonna offer a single prediction for each club in the league with generally a positive spin. Now, if this particular video concept seems familiar to you, yes, I did heartlessly rip off Daz Talks Footy for this video idea, and I do wanna give him a shout out. Daz Talks Footy has done this exact video albeit with different predictions. And that is what has inspired me to create my own version of that. So first of all, I wanna give a big shout out to Daz Talks Footy. Two and a half thousand subscribers for the quality of content that that guy makes is absolutely criminal. Probably the most underrated AFL YouTuber out there. So if I can give him anything back by stealing his idea, I'd like to shed a little bit of light on his channel because he does great work. If you are an enjoyer of the True Footy YouTube channel and this kind of AFL fan made analytical content, you're gonna love Daz Talks Footy. All right, what I'm gonna do is work through each of the 18 teams from the top of the ladder all the way down, it's good to mix up the order, and give a single prediction for one thing I expect to see from that club in season 2024, which means we will start with the Premier's Collingwood. For them, I still think the key forward question is the number one thing they need to answer to be able to stay in the Premiership hunt. And they've got a few candidates to fill the void left by Dan McStay, and it seems to be, at this point in time, a bit of a battle between Ruth McInnes and Ash Johnson, and there's a big contingent out there that think Ash Johnson is the man. I'm going to make this my somewhat bold prediction and say by the end of season 2024, Reef McInnes is the first choice forward for Collingwood, outside of Brody Marchek, obviously. So in other words, a tall trio, if you like, of Reef McInnes, Mason Cox, and Brody Majacek as the three pillars down forward. I think this guy who's just turned 21 has a lot of potential and had a great year in the VFL, so that's my ballsy prediction for them. For the Brisbane Lions, I'm going to simply say that my prediction for them is that I'm locking in Harris Andrews as the first choice key defender in this year's All-Australian team. I think he's still you know, in the peak of his powers, still got plenty of years at his prime, I would have thought, and probably the best player in the game for his position. Sam Taylor might have something to say about that for sure, but I'll say it lock in Harris Andrews for all Australian key back. For Port Adelaide, who came third, my prediction for them is that Mitch Georgiatis will seamlessly slot back into this team and kick over 40 goals. And I'll probably go further and say that's probably gonna make him the top two goal scorer at Port Adelaide this year. I'd probably still back in Todd Marshall for number one. But Mitch Georgiatis is coming off an ACL and I do foresee a little bit of a forward line transition here for Port with you know aging guys like well, Charlie Dixon in particular. And Finn Layson is probably still in that team. I think he probably is a little bit underrated considering how many goals he kicked last year. But I think Georgiatis is immensely talented to keep 32 from 21 in 2021. And I think 40 goals is not too crazy a prediction. So it's a little bit bold coming off the ACL, but I think Georgiatis is going to have a good year. For the Melbourne Football Club, it has been a lot of negative press for the Ds this off season. And I am going to say that my positive prediction for them is that Caleb Windsor will come in and become a, an established, important best 22 player almost immediately. There's been a bit of footage of him at training. He looks absolutely unreal. Uh, his skills, his silk, his pace. I, I was a fan of his pre-draft. He still went a little bit earlier than I expected, but I think for the D's specific needs and the way he plays means he doesn't need to take that long to be able to impact at AFL level because he's more on the outside. I think he brings something different to the D's team. I think he would bring in something different to most teams. That's how good his attributes are specifically. So I'm going to say Kelly Windsor becomes an important player and plays every game he's fit for this year. For Carlton, I am going to say that my prediction for them is that Sam Walsh is their best player in 2024. So that includes Charlie Kerner, okay? I think Sam Walsh is going to come in and have a Brownlow quality season. He's going to be their best performed midfielder over guys like Cripps, who won it two years ago, uh, Adam Chero, the way he ended the season, overcoming a bit of a, well, a pretty bad back injury in the first half of the year. I think you extrapolate that form, Sam Walsh is going to be the number one man at Carlton this season. For the Saints, who finished sixth, my bold prediction for them is that Max King gives the Coleman a serious shake. And I guess to be specific, probably top two or three. Kicked 28 goals from 11 games last year, 52 from 22 the year before. Those are already really good numbers and he is just hitting his prime now. I think he turns 24 in season 2024. I'm backing in St Kilda to have a good year. I think their forward line is talented and while they have forward line efficiency issues, if they can rectify that even a little bit, I think Max King is a genuine chance to win the Goldman. For GWS, I will say that Finn Callahan breaks out to such an extent as a running midfielder this year that he averages over 25 touches a game. So he's picked three in 2021. He's not even 21 years of age. 
Played 21 games last year, averaging about 21 disposals, about five score involvements a game, which is pretty damn solid. 76% disposal efficiency. In the past, he's had to overcome, you know, a troublesome foot injury. I think if you give this guy enough momentum, he will establish himself as a gun player as early as this year. So 25 plus a game for Callahan. For Sydney, this one is a little bit audacious. So I'm going to talk about a guy I haven't talked about at all this preseason, I don't think. Uh, Isaac Heaney returns to form and kicks at least 45 goals in season 2024. Last year, it was only 30 goals, a little bit down on his usual output. His impact wasn't great. His kicking radar was not was a little bit off. But 49 goals the year previous, I'm backing him in to get back to that form because I also think Sydney will be in the mix this year to genuinely contend for the flag. And Isaac Heaney will be a big part of that. For the Western Bulldogs, my prediction for them is that Riley Sanders, again, plays every game that he's fit for and averages at least 22 touches. Now, 22 touches might not seem like a massive prediction because we kind of desensitized a little bit to how good that would be because of Sheasel's amazing first season and Dacos as well. But Riley Sanders is a very different type of player. He's going to be much more in and under at the contest. And considering how ready-made he is, I'm going to back him in to have a big impact at the Bulldogs. And comparatively, 22 touches would be a damn good season. I don't know off the top of my head what Ashcroft averaged. Probably around the mark, maybe even slightly less. I don't know. Let me know in the comments. And we all know that Ashcroft had a great year and he played as a genuine midfielder as opposed to a running defender. So Riley Sanders to have a big year with 22 touches a game. For the Adelaide Crows, I am going to make a prediction that Daniel Curtin establishes himself as an integral part of their back six. So we know that Nick Murray's out with an ACL and you're probably going with Worrell and Butts and I know that Keane's in that mix as well. But Curtin comes in probably as a third tall sort of loping defender and I think he has the capacity to get a lot of the ball to set up play out of the back half with his really good left foot. So when I say integral, I just mean that in his first season, sort of like Ruben Jimmy for West Coast in his first season, he will be important enough that if he misses with injury, you would genuinely think that it diminishes Adelaide's back six, which I think is a fairly ballsy call. For Essendon, this one is ballsy as well. I did, the, the purpose of this was not actually to be bold, but they all seem to be a little bit audacious. But I will say Jake Stringer gets back to not his absolute best form, but he kicks 40 goals this year. Last year, 21 from 17 wasn't a great return. 25 from 15 the year before. I just have this feeling with Jake during a contract year, you know, genuinely, he needs to have a big year, as I talked about in a previous video. And I think, I think he will recapture some of his best magic form and kick at least 40 goals this year. For Geelong, my prediction for them is that Tanner Brun will be their top midfielder by the end of the season. And I don't want to make this a backhanded compliment, but looking at Geelong's stats, particularly through last year and the way their midfield didn't really have the same depth of ball winners, it's not a massive bar. So Cam Guthrie averaged the most disposals, which is not the best metric on its own, but it's worth mentioning. Guthrie had about 22 touches a game, only played six games. Atkins, you know, only had the 19 down from his usual output. Tanner Braun averaged about 16, and I would back him in to get close to that 23-24 mark. Like, again, it's not all about disposals, but there's somewhat of an indicator, right? And I'm going to say Tanner Braun has a really good year and elevates himself to being the main man at Geelong in their midfield. Then we've got Richmond, and there's a few options here. I'm going to go with, I'm going to pluck one here. I'm going to say that Steely Green plays at least 12 games. And there is a little bit of bias here because I've got a mutual friend with Steely and I've heard through the grapevine that he's a tremendously hard worker and I've been doing a little bit of research on him. First of all, I think he kicked four goals in their intra-club or match simulation not long ago. Uh, but when you factor in that Steely as a late draft pick for Richmond a couple of years ago, he was coming from a long way back. Like he's not a big kid or wasn't a big kid and he only started playing football at about 15. What I do know about him is he's a tremendously hard worker and I think he will catch up on a lot of the other prospects that were drafted earlier than him. And with Richmond, they're kind of in the position where after a couple of years of no high draft picks, they're gonna have to mix through a few opportunities for these guys and I'll back in Steely Green to play 12 games in 2024. For Fremantle, this one is going to be unpopular for anyone that doesn't support Fremantle. I think Nat Fife has his best season at AFL level since 2019. And to clarify, he hasn't had a good run since 2019, particularly from an injury point of view. He hasn't played more than 15 games in a single season since then. Battled some injury issues, absolutely. His fitness has been a little bit off and he can't get any continuity. But sounds like he's in ripping shape. And one thing that I found, found quite compelling is they're actually gonna play him primarily as a midfield player who just floats forward. And if they get that mix right with the rotations, I still think Five has a lot to offer as a pretty crash and bash midfielder. It obviously depends on how well his body copes with that, but I feel like we are gonna see a season from Nat Five that you didn't see coming. Not Brownlow quality, because I don't think he'll get enough 
minutes on the ball, to be honest. But he's kind of a bit of a forgotten gun at Fremantle, and I think they could use the midfield reinforcement. For the Gold Coast Suns, my prediction is that Matt Rowe makes the All-Australian squad. Again, really young player, really. Uh, just had a, such a profile for so long that it feels like he's been around for a while. But uh, I think he turns 23 in this coming season, and he was the number one tackler in the game last year. 21 touches a game, eight tackles a game, and 7.7 .7 clearances. I've said previously in a video, He's just a little bit inside dominant, and if he just starts to accumulate the ball a little bit more, he will start getting noticed more for the stuff around the footy. But I think he's actually on a pretty good trajectory, and I think AA squad is within his reach this year. For Hawthorne, this might seem a little too obvious, but I will say that Mitch Lewis kicks at least 60 goals this year. Again, I feel like I'm repeating myself, but I've made so much content, it's hard not to do that. But the compelling case for it is 37 goals from 15 last year, backed it up from 36 from 15 the year before. I think this guy's already a good player. It's just a case of him not having, you know, a continued run at it to fully demonstrate it. I think he has a profile. 60 plus goals would be a great season. And that probably puts him third or fourth in the comments. I'll back him in to do that. For North Melbourne, I will say that Colby McKercher finishes top three in their best and fairest. Now, for those who might not have seen my content too much over this off season, that might seem like a backhanded compliment. Uh, it's not. I just think that Colby McKercher is so damn good and I think he has Dacos-like qualities, meaning that he will rack up a ton of the footy and he has the pace to burn and absolutely delightful foot skills. I really, really rated him as a draft prospect going into last year's draft and I think he will be good enough to rack up the footy a la Sheasel and use the ball well to really stand out. It's not a mark of disrespect on North Melbourne's quality, but if Sheasel can win the best and fairest last year, I think McKercher can make top three this year. And for West Coast, this one is, I've pulled out some ballsy West Coast calls lately. I'm going to say, <laughs> this is so contentious. I will say Jeremy McGovern makes the All-Australian squad. Not the All-Australian team, the All-Australian squad. I think I've had some serious Jeremy McGovern blue balls over the last two years because He's been so decimated by injury that it's easy to forget that he's a damn good player. And you might factor in, okay, he's aging, he's getting on, but he has stripped down a lot in terms of weight, not clothes, in the last few years. And as such, it's really translated in his game because the football we saw from McGovern in both 22 and a little bit in 23, I think, he just needs to play 20 games in a season. My memory of 2022 was he was probably our best player in the first half of that year. And then someone like crunched his rib cage and he didn't play again after that, I don't think. And then in 23, he rips the hamstring off the bone in the derby in round three. So bold call, very ballsy call. But I did want to go with something different and I am backing him in to be a good player. I think he will have a great season if we can keep him fit. <sighs> I'm sick of saying that. Anyway, guys, that is my take on one prediction for each of the 18 AFL clubs. Let me know in the comments if anything you want to add to that or anything you think I'm wildly off the mark for. But either way, I appreciate you watching. I appreciate you being subscribed and I will see you in the next video. Cheers.